What is going on ladies and gents? Been a while. Now, let's just get right to the point here. Looks like um, I found some information that was passed on to me by Rajikabu on Twitter. I'll leave his uh, Twitter in the description below. Go feel free to check him out. Before we get started, Chris Patel actually made a video on this exact topic. Feel free to go check it out. I'll leave your card over here. Um, but uh, anyway, so let's get right into it. The point is, Palantir has actually been doing this stuff for a while, right? We all know that these guys are pretty much like a, what, a 17 year old company, give or take. Uh, a lot of the the traffic and, and the attention goes towards things like Foundry. Apollo should have more attention, but goes to things like Foundry, Gotham, and that kind of stuff. It's kind of their flagship thing right now. Palantir has and has had and has been working on, okay, and has presented and has sold a cybersecurity product. And uh, the cybersecurity product, the product is actually named Palantir Cyber. Now, I'm flattered. Alex Carp is definitely watching my videos. Thank you, man, for naming that uh, product after me. You know, honestly, um, I will take my my trophy. Yeah, there, there's my trophy right here. I'll take my trophy. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> I'm just fooling with you guys. Obviously, it's not named after me. The stuff predates my, my trip to YouTube. Just real quick on the cybersecurity side of it. This is kind of a clusterfuck of situations where there's a lot of different companies that are doing this stuff. Um, CrowdStrike is really famous, one that everyone is, is onto. I know a lot of retail investors are into that as well. Good company. But typically speaking, you know, CrowdStrike or Palantir, for example, is not the only one in this space. This is quite a large problem. As the data sort of stacks start getting fatter, you know, as we progress into this unknown, obscure future that we're all heading into, <laughs> uh, this is definitely a problem that's going to come up over and over and over again, especially since here where we are, where, li where we live you know, proceedingly in the, in the Western world, for the most part, at least, uh, it's highly coveted for the information that it gathers, right? So like, there's a lot of cyber attacks. I mean, I've, I've seen it personally. I've sit, I've sat in incidents where we've had literally live attacks happen at the moment. And we've had to like help throw out this, thwart the situation, uh, given the tools we've had. And sometimes it's successful, sometimes it's not. And many times, you know, it's sort of just like nothing, nothing really happens. And it's just a, you know, somebody fooling around and, and they get it and get out. But there are some times that it's actually quite malicious, data gets lost, and, and I've had one incident like that. So I can tell you that it's it's quite verbose and it does actually affect the company that you're in and <laughs> people get fired and all sorts of crazy shit happens. And, and this is a very real situation, a very real problem in this world. So the point I'm trying to make is it's not gonna go away, okay? It's here to stay. So this kind of solution is definitely something that you need. And Palantir seems like they've been ahead of this stuff. They've been working on this from before. Now, my question is, and this is the same stuff that you know Chris might've asked in his video, which is, you know, why haven't they brought attention to this stuff yet? I mean, they really need to start monetizing these random obscure products. Now, I have a theory on this, though, before we get into the cybersecurity side of it. I actually think they're rolling a lot of the the ideas of how this cyber works and all these other disparate, you know, solutions that they might have had into something like Foundry, and they're selling it as one massive platform. I don't know. Maybe I'll talk to Coach Drop about it next time. Coach Drop Man, if you're watching, let's talk about it next time, <laughs> if you can, man. Anyway, so this Palantir cyber situation... Um, it hinges a lot actually on very typical things that a lot of other cybersecurity plays hinge on. Things like anomaly detection, uh, some place to catalog it, um, like knowledge management or you know, some sort of identity system um, access. Uh, what else? Um, there's investigation. So like there's contextualization of all this data that comes in. Now, in my opinion, where these companies differ is the, uh, the level of efficiency and the level of contextualization they're able to apply on these disparate data sources, right? So what that all means is so here's, before we dive into this, right? Here's what happens, guys, okay? Um, on any company, there's actually multiple things that have data sources, right? So anything, like I'm talking from, if you work somewhere, right? If you have a key card that goes into a database, that's a data source, right? Any IT product that you have, if it's applications, each application will have its own sort of log store. Um, you know, there's a general IT infrastructure, the networking that itself has its an, another log store. The actual machines that things run on, those things have their own log store. And when I mean log store, I mean the logging system, like the things that happen within it, it actually gets stored somewhere. Most It's a choice. You can choose to store it, right? Most of the time, it's always chosen. It's You always store it. It's, it's like if you just let it go, like you're an idiot, okay? Most of the time, you always store it. And this is part of the problem. Tons of these companies have like lots of this stuff just sitting there doing nothing. So there lies the first problem, which is a lot of these different systems have logs and different information that gets gathered, but really nobody knows what to do with it. No one knows how a web server over here is affected by, you know, someone using a key card to open it over here. Do you know what I mean? Like the, 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 the matching is not really done right away. It's not done like in within the company itself. Now, 
some places like I've done a system where like I've actually, um, you know, built together sort of like a logging tool and, and wrote in parsers that say, okay, if this, this, and this happens, then you're probably looking at this situation or whatever. Right. But it's very rudimentary. Like you're looking at almost things that you're expecting. This is not like a, it's not future, future looking, right? You're not going to be able to use that kind of system that I built to say like, what kind of things are going to affect me a week from now, or, you know, do like a vulnerability test or see what is a problem right now. That's going to crack later or something like that. It can only tell you based on hindsight. So systems like these CrowdStrike, very, very important to the thing because they, they pull together lots of data sources and actually try to make sense of it. Now that's where the next thing is. So now anomaly detection, what Pounty is using, I believe is like a distributable data store. And this allows you to form clusters from which you can actually query. So, so what that really means, right? Is say, for example, you have a ton of data, right? You can go into each and by the way, guys, data stored usually in some form of tables. And when you query something you go, like the actual engine goes line by line by line by line and, and pulls out what you're looking for, right? Or a list of what you're looking for. Now, if you have massive, like I'm talking like terabytes and, and gigabytes and terabytes and petabytes of data, you can't just go line by line. It's going to take you literally days, <laughs> right? Especially if you're doing multiple sources. So you need to find a way to scale it horizontally. And by doing that, you can form these clusters of like contacts and you can actually query those clusters instead. So you're querying large data sets in a matter of like seconds or minutes, you know, very short period of time, basically. Uh, and and in, a, in a field like cybersecurity, that matters because, you know, within a half an hour, the attack could change. So but as you're solving the problem right now, a new attack could come in from the same attacker, which could have a totally different profile and you wouldn't have been able to guess it. So you need to have that, you know, minute level or even second level at times, almost real time level uh, detection and, and, and sort of cataloging for that part. So I think what they use is uh, like a lot of it, Apache stuff. Palantir basically uses a ton of Apache stuff, which is totally open source. So, hey, if you want to compete with Palantir, you can totally do it. You just got to <laughs> know pretty much all of the Apache data suite. So, um, yeah, I think they use Apache Pig. But what I was reading was they do their their data store, that distributed data store is called Palantir Phoenix, which is actually kind of cool. So it's interesting. I want to find out how they actually built that Palantir Phoenix store data store. And then, by the way, this is why I think they're rolling a lot of this stuff into Foundry, because if they were able to build this sort of clusterable, you know, um, distributed data store, then basically they're probably already rolled that into Foundry so that they can add these multiple data sources and actually have that contextualized layer and be able to query really fast. That's probably one of the reasons why it's easy to onboard, right? Because uh, a lot, a large part of onboarding is actually what your data schema, so you, whatever your data looks like, has to go through these filters. And that's part of that onboarding process where they say, okay, no, we're looking for this, this, this. And these guys say, okay, then we have to write all these filters. Now, Palantir probably has an automated way of doing that, I, I think. And that's probably what makes that onboarding much, much faster. So that's something to talk about, I think, later. So then comes the contextualization and the sort of investigation part of it, right? Now, this is actually the real bread and butter. This is where I think the main difference is between something like any product, any security product, right? Everyone almost always does the same thing. You Almost because you need that. You need this level of stuff for you to actually be taken seriously. But the idea is that you have multiple different variable disparate, like totally unrelated data sources. And you have to find some way of making that connection saying that, okay, um, the connection, like reason why this happens and this happens leads to actually some kind of incident and you should flag that in the system, for example. Right? So this level of stuff is like, you're, you're basically programming like a pseudo brain within this program to say, okay, look for this and let me know when it happens. Um, so this, this investigation part of it is very, very key, mainly because it takes that, distributed data store with the context, right? And actually tries to make human sense of it. It takes it to another layer and say, this changed, but also these other completely, totally random data sources have anomalies. Let's put them together because I think it's related and present it as an alert. So that kind of stuff is actually kind of next level. It takes a lot of practice. I think they definitely had a lot of insight into this and, and trial and error. Part of it mainly because I think they, <laughs> they helped build some of this stuff for the government, right? It's, um, you know, probably built into Gotham already. I'm not, I don't know, but I'm just saying. So um, they, they definitely have a lot of experience here from the cyber attack and cybersecurity side of it. So that, that really, I think, is going to come into play here. But anyway, the last thing which I really thought was interesting is that they have this like knowledge based system. And guys, for those of you who don't know, knowledge based and documentation is very key. Like, I've literally quit a job because they have no documentation. Like, I joined the company. And they're like, oh, let me train you. And I'm like, okay. I joined the, the conference call and the guy, no video, nothing. It just like is talking to me about how this stuff works. I'm like, dude, I need diagrams and stuff. You can't just tell me stuff. I can't write. Like, what is this? 1980s? Come on, man. But anyway, 
So they have a knowledge based system where as, as these anomalies come by, I'm sure there's some forms of like APIs in between the where, you know, the user, once the incident comes in can say, okay, you know what, flag this incident, solve it. And once it's solved, that entire profile gets sort of like grandfathered into or stored into this database, which is shown to further users in the system as some sort of knowledge base, which by the way, is actually a learning tool. So for IT staff, knowledge base is basically your way into how that company works and what you have to do and what your day-to-day -day would be and that kind of stuff. So it's very, very important. And and on top of that, they had this like cyber mesh situation happening where, you know, as you put in stuff, you can actually share information with everyone else in the network securely, of course. Um, some things I'm sure are going to be, you know, removed, but the type of incident and the solutions will be sort of posted almost like a community. Now, this part, I don't know if it exists still. I don't even know if this whole product exists, but the idea is that if that, if that's really true, this is amazing. You're basically creating a community of people that can defend against like very similar, because what happens in a lot of cases where these hackers like find stuff is they'll attack you one way. And once you solve it, they're betting that the next company doesn't actually have the solution that you used to solve it. So they'll use that same attack there anyway. So that kind of stuff is, I think, pretty interesting. Now, how much of this stuff are they going to sell in the future? I don't know. But to be honest, I feel like a lot of this is rolled into foundry and, um, you know, they really should have monetized this. That's another misstep, in my opinion, uh, because this would have been big. I think <laughs> five, six years ago, when when I think this this kind of stuff was actually like presented, it would have been like really a game changer because really there weren't that many people out there doing it. Now, I, I did work for BlackBerry. They didn't have a decent security system at the time. And this is like I'm talking like 2011, 12. So um, apart from a few players in the enterprise space, there weren't that many. So um you know they really could have capitalized here but you know it is what it is who knows i mean as these things progress and as foundry gets rolled out in my opinion as like a larger platform i think people will start taking maybe it'll be like a module right maybe remember how alice carp was saying we're going to start modularizing their like our, our components and things like that so maybe counter cyber would be like a module sitting inside foundry that people can just pick and just use as a as like a pseudo ui within foundry itself or something it's possible who knows that's it for me for today i will catch you guys in the next one Go check out Chris Patel's video. That stuff is pretty informative. He actually has the video of this stuff, so feel free to go check it out. Until then, I will catch you guys on the next one. Peace.